Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 376. I'm the host, Kyle Anzalone. A lot of news to get to on today's show. Just a couple of plugs first. The first one is Antiwar.com is hosting their fundraiser. Right now we have matching donations from Roger Waters. So that's really awesome. Uh, Roger pledged 20000 of his own money if we get 20000 donations from you know our individual donors. And this is how Antiwar.com op- operates. We don't get you know any big money here. It's just our small operation doing what we can with what little resources we can and you know there's not many alternative media sites out you know independent media on the internet right now that puts out more content than antiwar.com uh, so go on help us out and make a donation uh, if you can't donate just go ahead and share the show you can find it on twitter at con underscore interest i always share the show out on my account at kyle lands loan underscore and with that Let's get into the news. The first article I have today is from Responsible Statecraft by Eli Clifton titled Foxes Watching the Hen House, DC Insiders Oversee Biden's Defense Plans. Eli writes, Earlier this month, the House and Senate Armed Services Committee named eight commissioners who will serve to review President Joe Biden's national defense strategy and provide recommendations for its implementation. But the Commission on National Defense Strategy, which is tasked with examining the assumptions, objectives, defense investments, force posture and structure operation concepts and military risks of the National Defense Strategy, according to the Armed Services Committee, is largely comprised of individuals with financial ties to the weapons industry and U.S. government contractors raising questions about whether the commission will take a critical eye to contractors who receive four. Hundred billion of the eight hundred and fifty eight billion in fiscal year's twenty twenty three defense budget. The potential conflict of interest starts at the very top of the eight person commission. The chair of the commission, former Representative Jane Harmon, a Democrat from California, sits on the board of Uridium Communications, a satellite communication firm that was awarded a seven year seven hundred and thirty five. $38.5 million contract with the Department of Defense in 2019. Iridium and its board members follow Iridium's code of business, con- conduct, and ethics, and all rules and regulations applicable to dealing with the U.S. government, uh, the company's spokesperson told Responsible Statecraft. And so, uh, of course, you know, these companies all say, oh, there, there's no conflict of interest here. You know, what we have, we have ethics, you know, statements and everything, and this is a former representative. So, of course, she's going to be, you know, non-biased and all that. What, you know, I'm sure she's not going in there and emailing this company and saying, okay, now what do you want me to do about this? What do you want me to do about this? What's our position on this? It's more that her views as a chair on that board, you know, reflect her bias towards war and towards continuing and growing the military industrial complex. And so putting her as chair of this commission means, that, you know, this is what the, the commission is going to end up doing. A, and back to Clifton's article, a January 11th press release announcing the commission's roster cited Harmon's current board memberships at the Department of Homeland Security and NASA, but na- made no mention of her ties to the military industrial complex which paid her eight hundred and eighty thousand in total compensation in 2021 harman held five uh, fifty thousand shares in iridium now worth approximately three million in march 2020 according to the company's disclosures and this is a senate arms services committee spokesperson uh, statement to Clifton uh, responsible statecraft. The members of the commission on national defense strategy each hold long records of ethical public service in national security leadership. The commission have committed to adhering to all government ethics policies, prevent any potential conflicts of interest. Congress will provide responsible oversight throughout the commission's work. And so imagine this, you have somebody who shows their bias by their job, right? She sits on the board of this company. Obviously, she represents the fiscal interests of this company and not what's best for the American foreign policy public. And they say, ah, nah, you know, she's ethical. We believe her. It's fine. Um, 
And that's just how this works in Washington, D.C. Uh, back to the article. That oversight will be complicated, judging by the financial ties to government and defense contractors held by six of the eight commission members. Let's face it, the National Defense Strategy and the Commission on National Defense Strategy are flip sides of the same coin. Mark Thompson, National Security Analyst at the Project on Government Oversight, told Responsible Statecraft, both are heavily inflicted by the Pentagon's spending and Pentagon contractors. Those folks have vested interests in spending more, said Thompson, in Washington national security community. And the way you get credibility is to work at think tanks funded by defense contractors or by serving on the boards of defense contractors. And these Compton's characterization of who is credibility appears to be reflected in the appointments to the commission commission member john jack keen serves on the board of ironet a firm that describes itself as providing collective defense powered with network detection and response and dr we empower the national security agencies to gain better visibility into threat landscapes across private sector with adamant anonymization of data while benefiting from the insight and vigilance of a public private community of peers the firm's 2022 second quarter report made clear that ironnet is dependent on government contracts keen i believe is also um on uh the institute for the study of war uh victoria uh no uh Kimberly Kagan, I believe, is who founded that group. So our business, um, uh, the report said, our business depends in part on sales to government organizations and significant changes to the contracting or fiscal policies of such government organizations could have adverse effects on our business as a result of operations. And so, you know, it, it's pretty clear that, you know, they say that you, if the government's going to change how they do this, it, it's going to cut back on their profit margin. And Keen is the person implementing this, which, you know, means this company, Ironet's uh, interests are going to be covered. Uh, another commission member, Thomas Mahankin, serves as president and CEO for the Strategic Center for Strategic and but budgetary assessment, a job that paid him nearly $400,000 in 2019, the last year which physical disclosures are made available. Major weapons firms and some of the government's biggest contractors are listed as funders, including uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne, BAE Systems, General Atomics, General Dynamics, L3 Technologies, Lockheed Martin, Northern Government, Regineon, and Boeing. So, you know, who's who of the military industrial complex? You know, Clifton goes on, but obviously, you know, what we see here is very clear that our policy is going to be directed by the people who profit off of and who, you know, sustain their very lavish lifestyles off of the military industrial complex. And that, that is some really bad news because of the next story I have, I wrote this uh, along with Will Porter for the Libertarian Institute on January 24th, doomsday clot tits closer to midnight, largely due to war in Ukraine. The risk of nuclear annihilation is at at its highest point in history, according to the Bulletin for Atomic Sciences, scientist BAS, the group said the war in Ukraine was the largest factor in its assessment that a civilization-ending event is now closer than ever before. The group, U.S.-based group used a doomsday clock with midnight to signify the end of humanity. On Tuesday, it placed the time at 23 hours, 28 minutes, 58 minutes and 30 seconds, just 90 seconds to midnight, the closest it has ever been since the BAS inception in the late 1940s. During the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, among the most dangerous episodes of the Cold War brainsmanship, two minutes remained on the clock. The BAS said its new assessment was largely but not exclusively based on the war in Ukraine and the increased risk of nuclear escalation between Western powers and Russia, though it cited climate crisis, bio threats, and disinformation as other factors. We are living in a time of unprecedented danger, and the doomsday clock reflects the reality. 90 seconds to midnight is the closest the clock has ever been set to midnight, and its decision our experts do not take lightly, BAS President and CAO 
Rachel Bronson said in a statement, the U.S. government and its NATO allies and Ukraine have a multitude of channels for dialogue. We urge leaders to explore them to their fullest ability to turn back the clock. Even if the conflict in Ukraine does not go nuclear, the risk of atomic exchange elsewhere remains high going forward. The Russo-Ukrainian war has changed the nuclear order, the system of agreement, and the understandings that have been constructed over six decades to limit the dangers of nuclear weapons, says Steve Fetter, a professor of public policy at the University of Maryland and a member of BAS, uh, the Bolton of Atomic Scientists, Science and Security Board. Since Russia invaded Ukraine last year, the West has gradually... Uh, stepped up its intervention on the behalf of Kiev. The Kremlin sees Ukraine as a core security concern and has long made clear that membership in the NATO alliance was a major red line. Nonetheless, the U.S. military bloc has continued to assert that its doors are open to Ukraine and other neighboring countries uh, to Russia, reiterating its pledge again last November that several Top Ukrainian officials have said that Kiev is now a de facto NATO uh, member of the NATO alliance. Though President Joe Biden previously warned of a third world war and nuclear Armageddon in the direct confrontation with Moscow, such concerns have been uh, waned in Washington. In December, an unnamed Pentagon official told a British newspaper that the U.S. had given tacit endorsement of Ukraine's long-range missile attacks inside Russia, saying the fear of escalation changed uh, since the beginning. The United States has also provided increasingly heavy weapons to Kiev, including some systems it previously refused to send, with the total price tag approaching $30 billion, The long list of advanced arms includes Patriot missile defense batteries, dozens of HIMAR rocket launch platforms, and national advanced surface-to-air missile systems, among other gear. Moreover, Washington is reportedly preparing to authorize a shipment of M1 Abrams main battle tanks to Ukraine, after repeatedly declining Kiev's request for the weapon, a move that could risk major escalation. The Biden administration appears ready to test this theory with the Kremlin's unwillingness to escalate. Last week, several unnamed officials told the New York Times that the Pentagon is now considering ways to assist Ukrainian strikes deep inside Russian-held territory, hoping the influx of new Western arms would support a major counteroffensive in Crimea, which has been under Moscow rule since 2014. So let's talk a little bit more about those Abrams tanks. This from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com. U.S. poised to send significant number of M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine. The Biden administration is now leaning towards sending M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine despite recent comments from Pentagon officials about how they would be difficult for Ukrainian forces to maintain, the Wall Street Journal reported on Tuesday. The Associated Press later report the administration is poised, uh, that's the quote from the AP, to approve the transfer under Ukraine. Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, which allows the U.S. to purchase equipment uh, for Ukraine. Military aid under USAI could take months or years to deliver. U.S. officials told the AP that the new weapons package for Ukraine that includes the tanks could be announced as soon as Wednesday. That, that's today. It's not clear how many tanks the U.S. will pledge, but the journal cited an unnamed U.S. official who said the administration could send a, quote, significant number of Abram, Abrams tanks as a part of a deal to get Germany to send a smaller number of its own Leopard 2 tanks. A source told Reuters that German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has decided to send tanks to Ukraine and to allow other countries that have Leopards 2 to do so as well. Poland said Tuesday it formally asked Berlin if it could send its Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine, as the Leopard 2 could deliver much more quickly than Abrams, since they would likely be sent directly from countries' military stockpiles. So the the U.S. fund that they're going to use for this, I, I'm very surprised this is how they're going to do it. I thought they would do uh, the presidential drawdown authority because that is buying tanks for Ukraine. But I believe, you know, you would buy them from Abrams and, and not from 
the the you maybe they plan to buy them from the own U.S. stop piles or something confusing like this. But uh, very interesting how this is going to to work out. Der Spiegel reported Germany is ready to send Ukraine 14 Leopard 2s from its military stats and will sign off on the delivery from Poland and ally Scandinavia. Pentagon officials have said that the Leopard 2 tanks would be better for Ukraine since they're operated across Europe, making spare parts and maintenance more available. But German officials wanted the U.S. to also send Abrams over fears that Ukraine ending up with a large fleet of mostly German-made tanks could single out Germany for potential Russian retaliation. Schultz previously said he was not providing tanks to Ukraine because he wanted to avoid July dread clash between Russia and NATO, but the U.S. and other NATO countries are less concerned about escalating the war and have put heavy pressure on Berlin to send the tanks. Hots and Congress have been pressuring the Biden administration to provide Abrams with Representative Michael McCall, a Republican from Texas, the head for the House Foreign Relations Committee, demanding the U.S. send just one tank to get Berlin to oblige. The U.S. providing its main battle tank would market the largest significant escalation in military aid for Ukraine. In January alone, the U.S. has pledged over $5.5 billion in military aid for Ukraine and started providing Bradley and Stryker fighting vehicles for the first time. The funds for the military aid are being pulled from the latest aid package for Ukraine, which was passed in December. At this point, the U.S. has authorized about $113 billion to spend on the war since Russia's February 2022 invasion of Ukraine. So, you, you know, this is a, a big deal, what's going on here. And we have, uh, you know, one response, I, I you know, maybe not directly from Russia, but, you know, th- this is what we're going to continue to hear from Russia. Lavrov says the West hybrid war on Russia is becoming a real war. In South Africa on Monday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said the Conflict in Ukraine is no longer a hybrid war between Russia and the West, but is turning into a real war. At a press conference with his South African counterpart, Lavrov said the West has been preparing for war against Russia for a long time. He claimed the goal was to destroy everything Russian from language to culture that has been in Ukraine for centuries to prohibit people from speaking the language of their mother's tongue. Lavrov said... Other Russian officials have repeatedly made clear that they believe this is not just fighting Ukrainian forces, but also fighting the U.S. and NATO. Ukrainian officials have also reflected this in their view with Ukraine's defense minister recently saying Ukrainians are shedding blood for the NATO mission. And we have the Pentagon Uh, planning to increase artillery ammunition production by up to 500% for Ukraine. The Pentagon is planning to boost production of its artillery ammunition by 500% over the next two years as the U.S. is depleting its military stockpiles by sending millions of shells to Ukraine, the New York Times reported on Tuesday. Since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. has pledged to send Ukraine over 1 million 155mm artillery shells. Before the U.S. Army began efforts to increase production, it produced about 14,400 105 millimeter shells a month, but under its new plans, that number could reach 90,000 each month. According to the Times, an army report said the plan will involve expanding factories and bringing in new producers in an effort described as the most aggressive modernization effort in nearly 40 years of the U.S. military industrial complex. The unguided 155 millimeter shells that are fired at howitzer includes parts produced in several arms manufacturers, including steel bodies made by General Dynamics and explosive mitts by BIE systems. American Ordnance pours the explosives into the bodies and several other contractors produce the fuses that are screwed into the shells. The U.S. 
plans to dramatically ramp up ammunition production over the next two years shows that the U.S. is expecting to support Ukraine against Russia for years to come and that there is no sign the fighting will end anytime soon. What's not clear is if U.S. policy is sustainable. As the U.S. officials have warned, it may be hard to continue arming both the U.S. and Ukraine as the war drags on. Ukrainian forces are estimated to use about 90,000 artillery rounds each month, which is more than double what the U.S. and Europe can currently produce. The U.S. had to dip into little-known stockpiles of weapons it keeps in Israel to keep both the Ukraine's artillery demand. The Pentagon also requested U.S. forces stationed in South Korea send equipment to Ukraine. So now we have this interesting statement from the Ukrainian President Zelensky. This from Dave DeCamp. Uh, at antiwar.com, January 24th. Zelensky cites military aid as big business opportunity for American companies. Ukraine's President Zelensky on Monday cited U.S. military aid as an example of big business opportunities for American corporations that can find in his country. Zelensky said in a video address to a meeting of the National Association for State Chambers in Boca Raton, Florida, that rebuilding Ukraine will provide a major economic opportunities. It's already clear that this will be the largest economic project in our time in Europe, Zelensky said of the Ukrainians post-war reconstruction. We have already managed to attract the attention and have corporations and giants of the international finance and investment world such as BlackRock, J.P. Morgan, and Golden Stats. Such American brands as Starlink and Westinghouse have already become part of our Ukrainian way, he said. Last month, Zelensky held a meeting with the CEO of investment firm BlackRock, Larry Fink. They agreed to coordinate on Ukraine's reconstruction and future investments in the country. Discussing U.S. military aid in his address on Monday, Zelensky said, Your brilliant defense systems such as HIMAR or Bradley's are already uniting our history of freedom with our enterprises. We are waiting for patriots. We are looking closely at Abrams. Thousands of such examples are possible. Possible. The U.S. policy of flooding Ukraine with weapons has been a boon for U.S. defense firms. Many of the weapons being sent to Ukraine are made by Raytheon, the former employer of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, prior to taking his... Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, now, I guess one thing to add to that is, you know, with it being tied in with, with other businesses as well, it's not just the traditional military industrial complex, weapons makers, contractors, and, and all of those people. But now these investment firms, these building firms that are going to look uh, to, to get major lucrative contracts, I'm sure, from international organizations and foreign governments uh, to build infrastructure in Ukraine. Next up. Erdogan says Turkey won't support Sweden's NATO bid over protest. So apparently in Sweden, there was uh, some demonstrators who more burned Korans in front of the Turkish embassy on Saturday. And Erdogan says Stockholm should not have allowed the protests to take place in that location. It's clear that those who are allowed to express such villainous to take place in front of our embassy can no longer expect any charity from us in regards to NATO membership applic uh, application. And, you know, I, I mean, it seems like a fairly insensitive gesture and probably seen as a, a big middle finger, not just from Erdogan, but from, from Turkish people and probably Muslim people in general. I'm not sure, you know, what exactly the, the demonstrators were hoping to convey by burning Qurans, but, you know, certainly I, I'm sure that seems an attack on a whole religion doing it in front of the Turkish embassy. It's going to seem like an attack on all the Muslim people in, in Turkey. Now, this is, uh, you know, maybe a good thing that, that Turkey is holding up on this NATO membership, particularly as there's so many other escalations going on in Ukraine. Uh, the, the fact that there's anything to tamp down on, uh, you know, you know the, the rounds of escalation, even if it's over something unrelated to the war in Ukraine, uh, the fact that this NATO membership hasn't happened yet for these two states is, is probably a good thing. Now, 
next up uh russia says still no date set for new start talks with us this is some bad news russia deputy foreign minister rabkov said monday that there is still no date set for talks between the us and russia on the latest remaining nuclear arms control treaty between the two powers known as new start the us and russia were set to meet on the treaty in november but russia postponed the talks citing us military support for ukraine the two sides were engaged in more broad nuclear arms control talks before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but they were canceled by the U.S. Rabkov said the conditions are not right for New Start talks due to recent escalations by the U.S. The present situation is discouraging for setting a new date, especially considering this escalation trend, both the U.S. actions and rhetoric. And, you know, I, I think Russia deserves some criticism here, not... Um, necessarily you know all to blame for for these talks not moving forward especially under the trump administration the u.s uh on the nuclear issue was making some pretty absurd demands like saying any deal would have to include china of course you know moscow doesn't have the leverage to just force beijing into some kind of a nuclear agreement and china doesn't want to be a part of a nuclear agreement between the u.s and russia because of the drastic difference in size uh between the u.s Russian and Chinese stockpiles. The U.S. and China, uh, Russia have thousands of nuclear weapons. China only has a few hundred. So, you, you know, that was a, a pretty good poison pill that, that Trump had always inserted into these talks. But, you know, despite what's happening in Ukraine, it's important to hold these nuclear negotiations. And we have Russian officials saying things about potential use of nuclear weapons. Uh, you, you know, you really hope that those uh, messages are being communicated far more clearly behind the scenes. And it seems that, th that these nuclear talks would probably provide a pretty good platform for that. Uh, one last story on Ukraine here uh, from yesterday. Several senior Ukrainian officials fired as corruption scandal rots Ukraine. Several senior Ukrainian officials resigned on Tuesday after being forced out over a corruption scandal that has rot Ukraine, resulting in the biggest government shakeup since Russia's invasion. Ukrainian President Zelensky said in his nightly address on Monday that he decided to make personal decisions after Ukraine's deputy infrastructure minister was dismissed and arrested, arrested over allegations of embezzlement. The official was arrested after the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine accused him of receiving four, a $400,000 bribe for facilitating overpriced purchases of generators that were imported into Ukraine in September. Officials in Ukraine Defense Ministry were accused of being involved in the purchase of military goods, including food supplies at inflated prices. The allegations resulted in a re um, resignation of uh, the deputy defense minister who reportedly oversaw the purchases. Ukraine's defense ministry insists there were no wrongdoing and any inflated prices were due to a technical mistake. The allegations have put Ukrainian defense minister um, under scrutiny, although he remains in his position. Another Ukrainian official to resign was the president's deputy head of office who was spotted driving luxury sports cars throughout the war. Ukrainian media also reported that a visor was living in a mansion and that he rented it for $6,000 per month, although similar properties in the same area went between ten and 25000 per month. Several other high-level officials also resigned on Tuesday, including regional governors, according to the BBC. Other top Top-level officials were forced to resign, including the Deputy Prosecutor General, the Deputy Minister for Development and Communications uh, and Territories, the Deputy Minister for Development of Communications and Territories, uh, two different deputies there, uh, the Deputy Minister for Social Policy, and the Regional Governors for, it looks like, five different regions here, including uh, Kiev. Uh, and then regions that have been, uh, you, know, you know, on the front lines, Zaporizhia, Kershaw, Sumi.
Ukraine has always been notorious for corruption, and Western officials often cite the issue when arguing why the country couldn't join the EU or NATO. In 2021, Joe Biden was asked if Ukraine will join NATO and said, the fact is they still have to clean up corruption. So there's a, a couple things that, that I think could be happening here uh, as to why Ukraine took this action now. They could be looking at membership in the EU or NATO, and maybe these were some of the demands that they had to at least come out and make a propaganda effort that they're doing something some kind of sweeping corruption probe. That's very possible. Uh, it's also possible that some countries are getting more, you know, colder and colder feet. Germany, Berlin, uh, Germany, for example, you know, being very reluctant to send the Leopard 2s. Maybe this is a move by Ukraine uh, to help facilitate that to show that they are trying to take care of the corruption problem. My guess is that this isn't going to in any way get to the root of the corruption problem and is maybe a band-aid, but probably more a political or power grab move by Zelensky and has very little to actually do with corruption. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are known to be corrupt in Ukraine who all kept their positions, who are far more uh, close with the, the President Zelensky. So I, I, I don't see this as actually uh, a major uh, anti-corruption move. It is probably more political power grab style move and, you know, could have other implications depending on you know, who was making what demands when Zelensky decided to do this uh, as to what kind of effects it could have. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show. I will have another show out for y'all on Friday. Uh, thanks so much for supporting AntiWar.com, the Libertarian Institute, and this show, Conflicts of Interest.